Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Generals gathered in their masses. We've got that story plus CRISPR's unintended mutations. But first, Saudi King names son the new crown prince, upending royal succession line. This comes via Reuters, and this is still a developing story as I come to you on the first day of summer. Saudi Arabia's King Salman made his son next in line to the throne, handing the 31-year-old sweeping powers as the kingdom seeks a radical overhaul of its oil-dependent economy. Although Mohammed bin Salman's promotion to crown prince had long been expected among those who follow the royal family closely, the timing was a bit of a surprise and puts the kingdom's future in relatively untested hands. Mohammed bin Salman replaces his cousin, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, a veteran security chief who led the Saudi campaign against the Islamic State and al-Qaeda at a time when Riyadh faces tensions with Qatar and Iran and is locked in a war with Yemen. His appointment may make Saudi policy more hawkish against arch-rival Iran and other Gulf rivals such as the aforementioned Qatar. Under his watch, Saudi Arabia has developed aggressive foreign policies, Yemen, Qatar, and he has not been shy about making strong statements against Iran. It is really not a question of if, but rather of when a new escalation with Iran starts, so said oil consultancy Petromatrix. And yes, America's next top president already called MBS, as they call him, to congratulate him on his promotion. Now, we talked about that radical overhaul of its oil-dependent economy just over a year ago here on New World Next Week in the story, Saudi Arabia Plans $2 trillion Mega Fund for post oil era, and that's kind of tied in with the coming agenda of 2030. James, a lot of deck chairs being rearranged on the old ship estate, so what do you make of this latest move? Well, it is interesting, and it does, as you say, upend over half a century of uh, tradition of succession here, and uh, to be fair, I suppose it's not the first time that King Salman has changed the succession order. When he came in a couple of years ago, he uh, deposed uh, Mohammed, uh, sorry, Prince, Prince Mukran in favor of Mohammed bin Nayef, and now he's deposing Mohammed bin Nayef in favor of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So another change, but this time a more significant one, because of course the succession line has been going th- horizontally through the uh, the, the sons of the uh, the founder of uh, the the Saudi royal family. Now they're moving on to the grandchildren generation, so they're moving down a generation. This means that uh, if and when uh, King Salman kicks the bucket, uh, there will be a exceptionally young uh, king in charge of the country for the first time in a very long time, and with potentially decades ahead of him to rule the country and implement his Saudi Vision 2030. And you mentioned that uh, before. In fact, he was the one who wrote Saudi Vision 2030. Uh, he was the architect of it, and I will put a link in to Al Arabia. Uh, where they have the full text of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, where you can read all of the ambitious uh, things that he's written about that he wants to bring about in the next uh, 10 years or so in the uh, Saudi kingdom. Um, But uh, I think probably the most important thing to note is that uh, MBS was the defense minister, or is the defense minister, who is the architect of the Yemen war, which no matter which way you look at it, even if you are a Saudi thinking about Saudi's interests and those, you know, fighting that proxy war against Iran, because that's what we know it's all about, blah, blah, blah. Even from that perspective, that militaristic perspective, it's a total disaster. Uh, The Saudi kingdom having spent billions of dollars on this and devoted all these resources to essentially arrive at some sort of a stalemate at this point where uh, the Houthis are still in control of uh, the capital, um, and they haven't really accomplished what they set out to accomplish. So uh, I don't think that's something he necessarily wants to put as uh, front and center on his resume. Um, Another interesting aspect of this is that uh, not only was um, Mohammed bin Nayef deposed as the, the next in line of succession, he was also taken out of his role as interior minister and replaced with... Uh, um, Prince Abdulaziz bin Saud bin Nayef. So I'll put a profile up of him. Um, that's an interesting little move as well, because uh, not only to lose the line of succession, but to lose the interior minister post, which had been a pretty important part of the Saudi deep state, but uh, it has been sort of defanged in recent years and even in recent days with some moves that have been made. So there's definitely a shakeup that's going on right now in Saudi Arabia. But unfortunately for 
the rest of the world, it does not mean a nicer, happier Saudi Arabia. I mean, certainly as uh, what you were quoting there, Iran is in the crosshairs and the whole Qatar brouhaha and all of that is just part of that. So I wouldn't expect a, a huge change on that front from MBS. And I was even talking on my own morning show this morning about Yemen and the code black situation for cholera going on there. So speaking of a militaristic perspective, we move to our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 314, with another article from our friend Brandon Turbeville on Activist Post, World on Precipice as Russia Threatens to Shoot Down U.S. Jets and the U.S. Refuses to Back Down. The world is perhaps closer now to World War III than it's been in five decades as the situation in Syria is heating up yet again. In just the last few days, three to four days, the United States has attacked the Syrian military, shooting down a jet. Iran has launched missiles into Syria. Russia is threatening to shoot down American planes, and the U.S. is just digging in its heels and continuing to threaten and provoke both the Russians and the Syrians. That's pretty much the micro version of the situation, a prime situation in which the U.S., may decide to conduct a strike against Syrian military forces or otherwise invade the airspace designated by Russia as off-limits, thereby calling Russia's bluff in regards to its threats. James, there's a lot of threats going on, and again, each, each, each move seems to kind of ratchet it up, and we know full well, just as we've already sort of seen, that America's next top president won't hesitate a moment to start launching missiles with whatever the mad dog and the generals gathered in their masses suggest for him to do, James? Uh, it seems that we keep going back to Syria when these dramatic escalations occur, and that is because they continue to escalate. It's hard to overestimate how important this is, and it seems on an hourly basis now, crazier and crazier stories are coming out. We have the, the shoot-down, and then we have Iran shooting some missiles into Syria, which is a significant step as well. We have uh, numerous reports in the last few days of pro-Assad drones, which is the way it's generally described in the Western MSM, i.e. drones, Iranian or otherwise, that are uh, operating in the Syrian theater that are being shot down by the U.S. You have uh, Russian uh, pilots buzzing F-16s um, in increasingly hairy situations. And, of course, in the immediate wake of this shootdown, which did not involve the U.S. using its deconfliction line with uh, Russia to warn of uh, potential activity before it occurred, uh, we see Russia basically uh, coming out and saying they're going to target any flying objects over Syria where its air force is active. Could you think of a scarier situation uh, in terms of uh, maintaining some shred of peace in the world other than being on that kind of knife edge trigger? And even that, I mean, that did send the, the Pentagon into a bit of a tizzy and they announced that they were going to try to start uh, to try to reestablish the deconfliction line with Russia as soon as possible. I haven't heard any update on that, but I will throw in a uh, link to a Truth Dig article, Can the U.S. Establish a Deconfliction with Sy Russia and Syria? I will also throw in a link to, I think, an important report for people who are confused by the kind of on-the-ground movements that are going on right now. There's a report on Al Monitor, the geopolitics behind the race for eastern Syria, talking about the different players and factions and where they're lining up and what's going on. Uh, part of this, I think, has to do with the U.S. and their ally slash proxies trying to carve out a piece of Syria that they don't want the Syrian government to come in. I mean, they're both fighting ISIS, right? Ha ha ha. But, um, but uh, the U.S. and the, the Kurdish uh, portion that they're fighting with uh, want to carve out their little piece of Syria that presumably will maintain their little piece of Syria no matter you know, it, towards the end goal of actually getting rid of ISIS. So there's definitely some geopolitics that are going on right now, and these are extremely important moves that really do put everything on a knife edge. Um, horrible, horrible developments here. And I would love to say that there's an easy way to climb down from this, 
but uh, at the moment there doesn't seem to be. And I've even uh, seen some reports of um, some Russian diplomats canceling meetings in Washington and things like this. So it just continues to escalate and ratchet up and up and up and up. And I fear that people are going to be the boiling frog at this point. Oh, we've heard this before. Oh, it's, you know, uh, it's no big deal. Uh, we don't, we can take our eyes off this. I, I think Syria continues to be the most furiously boiling cauldron on on the stove at this point, and uh, we should definitely be keeping our eye on the day-to-day developments there because it could get a whole lot worse a whole uh, very quickly depending on what moves are made in the coming days. I think if you could look at a sort of word cloud of things that we've talked about over the years on New World Next Week, the word Syria, I think, probably just gets larger and larger and larger. And again, everything that we say always included down in the show notes. And really, this article from Brandon Turbeville, World on Precipice, I chopped it down to just the essentials. So reading through that entire article will give you the breakdown of all of these developments to sort of get you up to date. James, this will be at least the second week in a row where I don't really have any good news to wrap up with the third and final story So we take it from our friend on Twitter, at Miles of Truth via Science Magazine. CRISPR gene editing can cause hundreds of unintended mutations. As CRISPR starts to move into clinical trials, a new study published in Nature Methods has found that the gene editing technology can introduce hundreds of unintended mutations into the genome. Quote, we feel it's critical that the scientific community consider the potential hazards of all off-target mutations caused by CRISPR, including single nucleotide mutations and mutations in non-coding regions of the genome, says co-author Stephen Sang. The first clinical trial to deploy CRISPR is now underway in China, and a U.S. trial is slated to start next year. But even though CRISPR can precisely target specific stretches of DNA, it sometimes hits other parts of the genome. So that's what they're talking about in non-coding regions. And this is what we've talked about in the past about GMOs. It's the ripple effect. It's the domino of all of these unintended consequences. And actually, if you hit the links and follow this, you'll see even the comments on Science Magazine saying, oh, great, more ammo for the anti-GMO crazies. But this paper is titled Unexpected Mutations After CRISPR Editing in Vivo. And James, I thought actually we had gotten into CRISPR a bit here on New World Next Week, but as I dug through the archives, it was just kind of a a related headline at the end of an episode. Yeah, uh, very telling that the first response is, oh no, now those GMO crazies are going to have more ammunition. You would think that people who are genuinely interested in science would be more interested in what this is actually telling us about the science and about what's going on and about what we didn't know. Oh, here's here's more info. Now we know more about what's going on and what could go wrong. That's a good thing. Why on earth should the first thought be, oh no, now we can't, you know, shove these GMOs down people's throats as easily as before? Uh, That, I think, shows the bias that's going on here. And it's not like we need to point out the fact that science can be biased or the people who perform science can be biased and come to pre-concluded, uh, pre, uh, basically work towards conclusions they've already worked out in their mind. But at any rate, there's more examples of that. Uh, for people who do want to hear the crazy anti-GMO people's version of what this is about, you can go to gmwatch.org, which has an article, CRISPR-induced mutations What do they mean for food safety? And a uh, short excerpt from that is, I agree that the whole genome sequences of gene-edited organisms must be submitted to biosafety authorities, and if the whole genome sequence did not show any additional mutations slash off-target effects other than those intended, this would be somewhat reassuring. However, it is highly unlikely that this will ever be the case. It is a matter of how many off-target mutations there are, rather than a matter of their total absence. The technology is not perfect. It will in future become less prone to off-target effects as it is refined procedurally, but it is extremely unlikely that it will ever arrive at a point where only the intended change will result. Which, right there, is the point. We will never have a 100% complete perfect uh, technique here, at least not with CRISPR, and we have to take that into account into anything that you're going to do with this, because there are going to be off-target effects, and you cannot plan for them, you cannot calculate them, and once they're out in the wild, they're out in the wild, guys. Nothing you can do to take put that genie back in the bottle, as we've seen many, many, many times with the spreading of these GM organisms, uh, despite best efforts of the, uh, the people handling these trials. 
Um, and just to put a little bit more humility into our most basic precepts of what we think we know about uh, these types of techniques and, and things, uh, this just out from sciencealert.com, DNA replication has been filmed for the first time, and it's not what we expected. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the pull quote here, it undermines a great deal of what's in the textbooks. So there are, uh, I'll let people read through that, but even some of the most basic things that that we have assumed, well, it must be like this. Once we actually get a, a sight of it, oh, wait, it's it's actually not like that. Oh, well, okay. So everything we thought we knew is wrong. And of course, this is science. This is how it works. We discover things that are new and that completely change our understanding of what went before. It happens all the time. And that should be expected by anyone remotely familiar with what science is. But of course, as I just said, there are people who have their, their pre-determined conclusions that they want to come to, and any new piece of information that undermines that, oh no, uh-oh, uh, what will the uh, crazies do with this information? So uh, let's maintain our anti-scientism stance, where we do not treat scientific consensus as it exists in this current moment as the truth um, and the only possible truth, uh, and let's maintain our humility. And let's definitely apply that to these genetic monstrosities that are being created in labs that, oh, by the way, isn't a perfect 100% laser-like precise uh, editing tool. It's actually a sloppy tool that will create random mutations. Speaking of performing science, I've got a couple of related. Uh, one, a scary new one, another one from Activist Post, filed under... Department of What Could Possibly Go Right, scripts scientists publish how they made bird flu more transmissible. So that's now all out there in public. See, James, we ask, you know, for them to for them to publish their reports, so they're just they're just giving the people what they want, right? The other is a flashback to something I reported on last fall, and it's in the Media Monarchy archives, and it came via again from Science Magazine. The Hollywood Reporter reports Jennifer Lopez set to produce new NBC bioterror drama at this point called CRISPR. Each episode of the new J-Lo produced show slated to air on NBC will investigate a criminal bio attack based on the CRISPR gene editing technique from a genetic assassination attempt on the president to the framing of an unborn child for murder. If the project moves forward, they're still all working on it and writing it. The drama will center on a scientist teamed up with an FBI agent, going against her former mentor at the CDC who's gone crazy mad as they battle for control over the human genome. So that is coming soon to some must-flee TV. James, any comments about Jenny from the Block? Oh, absolutely not. Couldn't care less. But uh, enjoy your predictive programming, folks. That's it. That's it. Coming coming soon to a boob tube near you. So there is a little bit of good news I can use to wrap up this episode. And that's the latest episode of the spinoff from New World Next Week. And it's called Good News Next Week. Some of the ways that we are winning in solutions-oriented stories, I call it, you got to fight for your right to repair. And it gets into homeless beekeeping, the right to repair movement, and the seed destructor. So you can find all of that down in the links below. And again, as we always like to say at the end of this episode, these... This is independent, non-commercial alternative media brought to you by you. And you can support our work at MediaMonarchy.com slash support and CorporateReport.com slash report. Slash support. <laughs> My man- easy for you to say. I know. Very easy. Uh, all right. Well, other than that, thank you very much for today's three stories, James. <laughs> Strike that last little bit of bumbling from the record, and this will be a great episode of Neural next week. Thanks, buddy.